Cool. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Matt, and I'm a developer advocate for JetBrains. And today, I'm going to be talking about some JetBrains stuff. Um, but we're not going to kind of dwell on exactly what's going on. We want to look at the sort of story of uh, what's happening under the, under the hood and have a look about uh, how we've managed to make IntelliJ and all of the family of IntelliJ IDEs work remotely, work with remote development and collaborative tools as well, so collaborative editing. Um, before we do that, kind of a quick sort of check as to sort of what remote development means here and why we're doing it, why it's sort of uh, interesting here. Remote development, we want to have the IDE, your source code, your dependencies, your entire tool chain hosted on a remote machine. And then you can work, uh, work with your code from anywhere, basically. You just need your laptop. You get the, uh, um, a user interface on your laptop. You can work from a coffee shop. You can work from home. You can work from the office, whatever you want. But you've still got your nice, powerful machine running on the server with all of your code. And this is all kind of really more useful these days now. We've got more sort of ubiquitous and reliable cloud computing, so you can actually have a, uh, a, a big instance running in the cloud um, with all of your code on there, and it's nice and powerful and working that. And you've got the reliable um, networking now as well, so you can actually make sure that you've got a good latency and working nicely there. There's good reasons for wanting to do it, wanting to work remotely. Uh, you can have, uh, you can keep your, IP, your, your intellectual property safe. If you do lose your laptop down the coffee shop, it's not, well, it's still a big deal. Um, but it's not a problem from the IP point of view. All of your IP is still on the cloud in, in, the, in your remote environments and nice and safe. You don't have to worry about lost code. Um, obviously, very portable. You can move around. You can go to your coffee shops and whatnot. I like coffee shops, apparently. Um, and you've got re reproducible dev environments. So we've been doing this for sort of a production environments with um, you know, containers and all this kind of uh, fun stuff. We can do the same thing for dev environments as well. So you can make sure that you've got all your dependencies correctly installed, that your entire team have got the same uh, setup as you. And you can very quickly get new team members on board and uh, up to speed uh, very quickly. And then we've also got uh, a collaborative tool as well, so Code With Me. So this is all built in, by the way, to the IDE. The IDEs have this built in. If you've got a license, it just works. It's great. Code With Me is a similar thing. It's collaborative editing, collaborative development. Uh, and obviously, you know, with a lot more working from home, you want to be able to do pair programming even when you're working from home, so pair programming remotely. And um, there's not just the pair programming scenario. There's a couple of... Uh, other scenarios in there as well. Mentoring is a good one. You can take somebody through a code base. Uh, you can navigate them around. You can guide them through it and show stuff. Um, mob programming as well, so you can actually get the whole team involved. It's not just two people. You can get, um, in this case, I think it's up to 100 people uh, involved there, which is, um, which is good and, and fun. And you know, some of you can be writing tests. Some of you can be writing production code. And uh, everybody works together, and it's, it's good. It's also good for code reviews as well. So again, taking people through um, a code base and looking at changes and trying to find out what's, um, what's different. I'm going to give you a quick demo, and then we'll start talking about um, what's happening sort of uh, under the hood. So this is uh, Gateway. Gateway is a small app, which is all you need as the entry point to remote development. Um, it looks very much like the welcome screen to Rider, IntelliJ IDEA, and so on, um, because it basically is. But we've got uh, a couple of ways of connecting to different environments. The very simplest is uh, with an SSH connection. You just give us a server, we'll SSH to it, and we'll set everything up and get going. You can also run environments in space, which is our integrated team environment, which has got you know, issue tracker, um, the source code hosting, chats, and all this kind of stuff. And we've also got integrations with uh, other providers as well, uh, such as Gitpod, so you can you connect to their ephemeral development environments. and uh, Google have just announced um, collaboration here with um, uh, Cloud Workstations, which is uh, really nice. Just quickly do an SSH. I've got this running on a virtual machine, um, just because I don't trust Wi-Fi. And you put in uh, an SSH connection, you start connecting to it, and it says, well, what have you got installed? What IDs do you want? Choose your IDE. We've got IDEA already installed. And then I can go off and find my um, project, Spring Pet Clinic, and then that will just uh, start the ID running on the remote machine, my virtual machine, uh, and connect to it. Of course, the problem with doing it on a, remote, a virtual machine is it's never as fast. So this is running the IDE sort of in a headless mode on the remote machine, and then it'll start the client to actually talk to it. Any second now. There it goes. And um, 
We've got a client here, and when that starts running, you'll see that it's basically the same user interface that you are used to for working with your DevBrains IDEs. You've got your, um, you know, your project windows, your editors. You've got your spinning beach balls. So normally I do this demo on a nice AWS instance, which is um, a lot faster, but we virtual machines work as well. So yeah, usual thing you'd expect. Um, project view, you can oh, navigate to the wrong files. That is, see all the files you've got in your projects. Open them up, source, uh, source uh, highlighting, syntax highlighting, tool tips, everything you'd expect, um, gutter icons. Uh, you can do tests, you can navigate around. Uh, you've got all the sort of features that you're familiar with, and basically it's the look and feel of a local application, which is nice. So let's just close that one for, for now. Um, that gives you the full development lifecycle. You can run applications. When you run it, you can, it tells you about uh, which ports you're using. You can automatically forward those and open your browser, uh, which is good. Um, if you've got an ordinary version of, <coughs> excuse me, IntelliJ IDEA running, um, you can run with code with me. Uh, this is a new UI, by the way. We've um, started with a, a bit of a refresh, which is looking rather nice. But at the top here, you've got um, a, a little icon there with a, a, you know, as a, as a person, and you can there start a new Code With Me session. Um, let me just end that one already. Start a session. You get permissions, whether you want to allow people to come in read-only, uh, give them full access. You can start a session. And that's going to give me a link. So if I just paste that in there, and I actually have to, have to paste that there. So that's going to start uh, a client, and we're going to have now um, a new session of uh, collaborative editing here. We get, this is, this is good because you do it on all on one machine there, but you know, it will be on two machines. You get uh, just a check to make sure that there's no man in the middle attack going on there. We're both uh, at with a security code of 6000, so we know there's nothing going wrong. And then we get a new session. And again, the person at the other end on the left here then is the guest. They get to see everything that's running on my machine um, well, within that project. It gets to see the project view, the syntax highlighted editors, and all that kind of uh, good stuff as well, even errors. And if I, um, where are we? So, so we, if there, you can see that there's a, a little cursor on both sides there, and I should be able to just start typing. And it's come over from one machine there, and if I go over here, oops, and I can do hello from other Matt, and we can see we've got sort of uh, collaborative editing going on there. So you can both edit stuff at the same time, you can navigate around, you can do uh, a whole load of stuff, you can run tests from the, the code with me, uh, session as well, and it's all good. So, great set of tooling there for remote development and uh, collaborative editing, but um, that's not the fun stuff. The fun stuff is how does it actually work? Um, so, um, there's a couple of key things I want to sort of make sure we've, we've noticed from the, that demo then really, is that um, there's a lot of similarities between the two uh, features there. So we've got remote development and code with me. They do, both do different things and they've got very different features, but technically they're very similar. There's a lot of things going on under the covers which is uh, very similar. They're both using the same client. So we've got this user interface which looks and feels like a local application, like a local version of IntelliJ IDEA or Rider or whatever, um, but it's, it's not. It's actually sort of broadcasting what's being done on another machine. And you can actually think of remote development as like code with me, but with a single guest. So it's, it's almost like a collaborative editing session, but there's only one person there, and they're, they're kind of using somebody else's machine to actually do all the hard work. Uh, one thing I should point out as well is that there's no code with me for remote development yet. It's on the roadmap, but right now, um, remote development doesn't support code with me. Uh, and again, also, all these features are available. If you've got a license, you can just start a code with me session. Right now, you can start a uh, remote development session as well. Just download Gateway. A um, couple of things I'm not going to talk about today is sort of the infrastructure type stuff, um, you know, server hosting and whatnot. If you, uh, remote development, uh, as I say, the simplest way of working with it is with an SSH connection. You just give us an SSH connection, we'll download the IDE, you point it as a project, and it'll get up and running. 
On top of that, you can have things like orchestration. So you can build your own environments. You could uh, have these pre-built environments with all your tool chain your de dependencies already there. You've got warm-up scripts you can have as well so that you can uh, get the latest version from source control, uh, warm up the IDE, do all the indexing, down download everything, compile everything so that when you start up your environment, you're really ready to go. You, you, know, you don't have to wait for anything, which is great for switching branches and starting new projects and so on. Um, but all that kind of orchestration depends on your project and where you're hosting it and so on. Uh, Code with me has uh, obviously a bigger server side thing going on there. We've got lobby servers to set up a session, relay servers for if you can't do sort of peer to peer or, or NAT traversal type uh, connections there. Uh, encryption, there's, there's a whole load of stuff we can talk about, uh, how the uh, traffic is all encrypted, but we're going to ignore that as well. I'm going to concentrate on this one. It's like, how do we take a 21-year-old desktop IDE and make it remote and collaborative by default? Because that's just a, basically, it's a crazy idea. And, um, and they've done it, which is um, pretty impressive. And you kind of start off, and I think the first question you'd probably ask is, well, why not just use remote desktop? Why, why, why go to all this trouble about rewriting and changing the architecture and something? And you could just use remote desktop. And we do have a project for that, which is a, a pretty impressive uh, uh, thing there, projector. This is a, uh, a, a library which you can run on your Swing-based apps. So um, IntelliJ, the IntelliJ platform is all based on the JVM, and the ID, the, the UI you use for um, JVM apps is Swing. It's very powerful. It's horrible as well if you ever want to have to use it. But what the projector can do is it can sit at a low level inside Swing, effectively replacing the renderer, and send all those calls over the network. And it's really very, very impressive. But it, it's not what the UI is designed for. You know, you're going to have latency and round tripping going on there. You're sending all these draw commands over to the, the network. And then all the input has to come back in. So when you're clicking a button, there's a lot of backwards and forwards. And so that's not very efficient. And if you're doing a remote desktop kind of thing for collaborative editing, or, well, for remote desktop, sorry, for remote development, um, then it doesn't know that it's being run in a remote development environment. You're running a machine interactively on a desktop, and it doesn't really know about remote development. It doesn't know that you're running it somewhere else. It can't do the more interesting, useful things like port forwarding and, and help you with your uh, code. And of course, it doesn't handle any of the collaborative stuff either. So it's like, well, OK. So. That kind of gives us one decision made already, is that we're going to need a local client. We can't just do this with um, sending, uh, you know, sending graphics over the network, projecting the, the UI. We're going to have to have uh, a local client. And we kind of also need to think about, well, what do these things need to do? What, what are the requirements we've got from this, sort of, this client and from this new architecture that we're going to build? And they're kind of different depending on the scenario, so depending on whether it's remote development or collaborative editing. So if you are running um, remote development, we want to be able to run the IDE on a remote server, uh, keep all of your source, your dependencies, your tool chains, compilers, everything on that remote server. But you want to be able to edit, run, debug, test the full life cycle locally. So you've got to have the full IDE feature set available to you when running locally. Um, we also want it to be operating system agnostic as well, so we want to be able to run the client on any operating system that we already support. So if you've got your MacBook, you can run it. If you've got a Windows machine, you can still run it. But also, you don't want to have to be tied, tied to the operating system of the server. So we don't want you to have to have a Linux machine because your host is running on a Linux uh, a remote server. So they've got to be able to sort of uh, keep separate there. Interestingly, right now, we also, uh, remote development requires a Linux host server. We will be supporting Windows and Mac in the future, but right now it's just uh, Linux. And the other thing is that we want it so that the, there's no local IDE necessary installed. You know, if, you, if the, one of the reasons for using remote development is that you can use a less powerful machine to get your work done, then you don't want to have to install the IDE on the less powerful machine as well. Code with me has slightly different requirements. Um, you're connecting to another person's IDE. You're trying to work collaboratively with someone. So it's not a remote host, a remote server that's, that's running there. Um, conceptually, it kind of is. But basically, you're connecting to somebody else's interactive IDE. You need to be able to do conflict-free concurrent editing, you know, so like Google Docs, basically, but with IDE features, uh, code completion, syntax highlighting, um, 
uh, and so on, inspections. You want to provide permissions and restrictions for the guests, so you can say a guest can join read-only and they can't edit anything, or you can let them edit all files uh, and so on. And a key difference, really, is that guests don't need the full feature set or the full user interface. So if I'm joining another session as a guest, I don't need to be able to change the settings. I don't need to be able to change uh, the JVM that's been set up or the uh, compiler version that you're using. Um, only the host needs to do that. Uh, and that is why, actually, Code With Me was implemented first, because we could actually ship it by implementing fewer features, uh, whereas remote development, you kind of need to ship everything. So it's there. And again, with Code With Me, um, operating system agnostic. We have some cross-cutting requirements as well, so not, you know, which just affect everything, um, you know, not just remote development or Code With Me. Uh, we obviously want to deliver an experience that's as good as or better than a local development. Better than might be a bit surprising, but the, if the reason of running this is to be able to run it on a more powerful remote machine, then we should be able to give you a better experience than if you were running the IDE on that local machine. But this means we need to include, include things like themes, key maps, plugins, and so on, so we want to be able to um, customize the experience. This needs to be built into the platform. You know, this, this is just a requirement there. It has to, we don't have to be you know, bolting things on. It needs to be supported by the platform itself. And a big one is that we don't want any massive rewrites. We don't want to have to rewrite the entire world to be able to support this. We want to be able to do this as incrementally and as uh, safely as possible. Um, we don't have, and, and kind of what I mean by that really is that you don't necessarily want to just move feature by feature to support uh, remote development or collaborative editing because there's just too many features. You know, you want it to be as ge general purpose as possible. So if you have inspections, for example, the little squigglies on the, in your code to show you where there's something that could be improved, we don't want to have to implement each one of those for remote development. We want to be able to support all of them. And so then as soon as you add a new um, remote, uh, sorry, a new inspection, it just automatically flows through. And this also helps us when we're supporting third-party plugins. We don't want to have to rewrite third-party plugins so that they understand how remote works. So this kind of gives us some obvious problems, really. It was like, the first one is that we want to decouple the features from the user interface, but it's then where do we split things? Where, where is the split? What is the local UI, and how do we, where, where do features kind of live, and, and, and so on? Um, and another big problem is that the IntelliJ platform, which is, as I say, it's been around for 21 years, um, it's not designed for this. It, it wasn't never built to, to work like this. There's obviously um, been lots of decisions made about the APIs based on the fact that you're interactive. And so there's lots of synchronous APIs because why not? You're right there. You don't have to make a network call for all of these things. Um, we want to build the ID as a server. We want it running as a remote machine. We need to talk to that. But what do we mean by server there? How do we handle multiple processes? Um, whereas before we've had just one process, which was the IDE, now we're going to have multiple of them. We're going to have multiple guests joining a, a session. We're going to have uh, a host. We're going to have a client. Is, um, how does that work? Uh, obviously, we need to fix this concurrent editing issue with the conflict resolution. And then we want to add on additional functionality for remote scenarios, like the port forwarding there. Um, so let's take one of those then, um, synchronous APIs. Um, as I say, the constraints and requirements uh, for a desktop app aren't the same when we're running it remotely there. So anything that you would think you can do because you're sitting on the same laptop there, uh, it can all be synchronous. You can make those calls. You don't have to think about the fact that now I need to round trip to a server. And it all kind of, um, it all kind of changes. But we've kind of, we can look at this differently. If we've got these synchronous APIs, they could be a problem. Um, but it also depends on where we split the IDE. So we've already kind of got an async boundary at the user interface as it is. You know, the user interface is asynchronous. You click, you, um, you get a response back, but you kind of, the, the way you interact with a, a UI is a asynchronous itself. So we can be async at the user interface boundary, but then the internal APIs, which are all synchronous, they don't need to change. You know, if all those are still on the same machine, then they don't need to change. So we can refactor these kinds of things and obviously avoiding the, the grand rewrite. Um, and one way which has proved to be very useful is to, um, to handle this with, with uh, the observer pattern, basically. If you're looking, if there are changes going on, 
Uh, we listen to those changes, we get notified of them, we serialize them, create an ordered flow of change events, and let the, the network know. So this is a great way to be able to sort of patch on effectively the um, d getting the data that we need and then putting it into, uh, into the network. So a good example of that is things like moving the text cursor. So there's a whole load of sort of synchronous APIs, as I say, going on in that, uh, in that process. But if we just add in a listener, then we get notified of the cursor now moving somewhere else, and we can put that into a stream, serialize it, and send it to the, to the client and get it displayed. So we want to split the IDE, um, but where do we start? You know, IDEs are big, complex uh, applications. There's a, a lot going on there. You know, the user interface is complex. They're dealing with a huge amount of data. You know, we've got uh, projects. Projects can be massive. We've got files. You know, they can have thousands of files. The files themselves can be massive. Um, we index the world so uh, we can find things quickly. So there's a huge amount of data going on. Where does that data live? Do we want to keep it all on the remote machine? Do we want to sync files to the local machine? So if we want to edit a local uh, a file, do we have to sort of sync it and all the things it needs to the local machine? So like doing an, an rsync type process. Um, but then if we're doing that, what's the difference between that and things like, you know, just a whole git checkout? You know, you could end up having to copy a huge amount of files there, which would then just be very expensive in terms of both network, disk space, and so on. So do we, should we leave the files sort of uh, on the remote machine and just, you know, use the text that we need? But then do we sync the indexes? So if we've got a copy of the indexes, we can do all the work locally to navigate around and find stuff. Um, or where do these, the, these things live? So the, the kind of question is trying to figure out whereabouts these sort of splits should be. Now, we already have solved this problem to a certain extent with Rider. So um, I presume you're all familiar with Rider? Super. Um, Rider Rider is a, um, an IDE for .NET, which has been around for a good few years. And um, it's based on the IntelliJ platform. The IntelliJ platform provides the user interface, the, um, the sort of the IDE parts of it all. And we use ReSharper as the language service. So ReSharper is a plugin to Visual Studio. Um, and you can immediately see now we've got the IntelliJ platform as a JVM application. ReSharper is a .NET application. They kind of can't live together. They can't run as synchronous APIs. They, they kind of got the same sort of problems going on here. And so we ended up with um, what we amusingly call a sort of microservices-based IDE. We have lots of different processes running to do different things. We've got the IDE running to provide the user interface, um, but we also have um, separate processes to host ReSharper to run the uh, language processing. Uh, the debugger runs as a separate um, uh, proce uh, process, yes. We've got external analyzers. We can run MS Build as a separate process, so we can actually run uh, the whole thing as uh, a whole bunch of different separate processes and asynchronous and so on. And we've built uh, a, an inter-process communication model which works with that. Um, my colleague Martin actually has a, a great talk, there's a link at the end, which sort of explains the details of what's going on here as well. The inter-process communication we've built is a hierarchical model, um, and the models themselves are observable, they're stateful, uh, and they pass just the sort of right amount of, of information across there. So, for example, if we're looking at the Alt-Enter menu, we don't have to sort of do a lot of processing with that. We just send over text, icon, ID for each menu item there. If you're adding a new menu item, you just add in a new block of text. It's very sort of lightweight, simple process for uh, talking between those models. And um, it's, it's interesting now that so the, the, the team that has built the, uh, the remote, de remote development and collaborative tools team um, that, that built all of this there, they've basically come from Rider. So they've taken the ideas from Rider there. Because you can see, if we've got this sort of microservices-based IDE, it's like, well, what if the IDE, the UI, and the ReSharper languaging host, what if they're on different machines? You know, that, that's, that's remote development. What if there were multiple front ends? What if there were multiple IDEs talking to this one um, version of ReSharper there? That's code with me. You can see where these ideas have come from. So, okay, that's great. We've got Rider can help us. Rider, we've got some prior art here. How does this work? So how does Rider solve this? How does it split the IDE there? And the way Rider does it is that um, it uses the IntelliJ platform 
as user interface, and it provides all these functionalities and stuff, but it does it by implementing platform APIs and delegating to Resharper. So things like find usages, the IntelliJ platform provides everything you need for that. It provides the UI, the, the keyboard shortcuts, the actions, and so on. What languages, what different IDEs need to do is implement what that means for their particular language. And so there's a lot provided by the platform and then the particular uh, language analysis will sort of figure out what it means for that particular language. <clears throat> it also gets to use um, language agnostic features. So IntelliJ provides uh, functionality for version control you know, web tooling, databases, these kinds of things, it gets those for free, but those live in, uh, in the IntelliJ side of things. They're not provided by Resharpa. So we've kind of got a, a split in a different place here now. We've got a whole bunch of things happening inside the IntelliJ platform, and then language-specific things happening in the Resharpa platform. So we've kind of got no obvious UI boundary here. You know, all the data is local to both processes. Um, we've got things which are implemented and doing you know, quite heavyweight stuff in the IntelliJ side of things, like version control, uh, you know, checking out all your code, logs, and so on, all happening in the IntelliJ side of things. Um, and then we've got language features happening in the Resharper side of things. So it's, it's, it's a thick client. IntelliJ is effectively being used as a thick client here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so Gateway's a little different, the, the remote development uh, tooling there. Um, it has slightly different requirements. And um, we can't use the language agnostic features unless the data is local. So um, IntelliJ provides us with a version control system, and uh, that's great. But unless the data is local, we don't get to use it. So if you're using IntelliJ platform as the client for a remote development scenario, this client will live on your laptop, which doesn't have any access to any of the source code. That version control is now useless on the, uh, on the client because all the data is on the remote machine. So uh, all the data is remote by default, and the only way we can really do that is by sort of syncing it across, but that's just gonna be far too much data to sync, and it's not worth it. You know, version control, we'd have to uh, sync all of your Git repository and the history and everything, and that's just basically not worth it. There's no, no point to that. It would take too long and so on. So this really kind of forces a decision on us that the split has to be done differently to, to Rider. The data is remote, therefore the features have to be remote. They have to work where the data is, uh, and so all of the data, all of the features, and all the functionality has to be remote, but the UI itself has to be local. So the UI has to be much more of a thin client. So we can split the ID at the UI la layer and build a thin client. We don't get to reuse any of the sort of foundations and functionalities that are in the IntelliJ platform, like the version control, like the web tooling, like the databases. But that's your IDE, and that's quite a complex beast. So if you want to build a thin client for an IDE, there's a lot going on there. You've got editors, you've got tool windows, you've got um, you know, version control, you've got all sorts of stuff going on. But there's a, you know, the, the key thing really here is that the UI doesn't need to know everything. It can be a dumb client, it can be a thin client, because the user only ever sees a subset of data. It doesn't have to, we don't have to sync everything over there. We don't have to send uh, all the data to the, to the client there. Um, they've got, so, um, yeah, so IDEs are complex. Uh, they, have, they can have very busy UIs. You know, we can have lots of tool windows open. We can have lots of editors open. The editor's got a lot of uh, text going on, and the text is hierarchical because that's how programming languages work. Um, but the things that you actually see are quite small. You know, you're gonna see a couple of tool windows open at the same time, not all 20 tool windows that you support you're not going to be seeing all editors all at the same time, uh, all of the files at the same time. And uh, the changes that happen are really quite small. So typing, okay, we need to update the document. You know, you're adding in a few characters. You can update the documents. You change the highlights in that class that you're working in, the inspections there. That's actually a nice small change. So if you want to tell the client that something has changed, that's a really small change. If you're copying and pasting in a big chunk of text, okay, you know, it's, it's a bigger change, but it's still, just a change in that file. If you've got a pop-up like um, the quick doc highlights telling you, you know, the, the documentation behind a particular function, 
that's just a small block of rich text, you know, a bit of syntax highlighting, a link to something else perhaps. But again, it's just a, a block of text that we need to show to the user. Even when you look at something which um, is more heavyweight, such as compiling, you know, if you're building a project from scratch, it's, um, there's a lot going on there. You know, the, the, com the computer's gonna be really busy and working really hard. But from the IDE's point of view, it's really quite, you know, th there's not much going on. Um, it doesn't have to redraw everything like, uh, a lot at all. Everything's happening server-side. The hard work's happening from the compiler. All we really need to do while building is show a, a text output log, which again is a small change. And also switching branches. If you're switching a branch on a massive project, you might be changing thousands of files. You might be adding new files, removing new files. Um, but the IDE is not necessarily going to change. You might have to close some editors that you got open. You might have to refresh some text. Um, and you can redraw the project view. So despite the fact that there is a lot of things going on, the changes that happen with the IDE itself are quite small. And yes, it's a complex uh, IDE, you know, from, from that picture that shows there, it is complex, there's a lot going on, but it's also quite hierarchical. And it's, it's sort of quite repetitive as well. There's lots of repeated features. So you've got toolbars, you know, there's toolbars everywhere. You know, tool windows as well, and the tool windows themselves will have toolbars. So if you can handle uh, buttons, icons, and actions, then you can, uh, you, you can do this. Editors as well, they're, they're the same thing. You, you might have a lot of them, but then it's just an editor. Um, so if we are using a user, if we're trying to build this sort of user interface there, if we treat these things sort of semantically rather than graphically, then we can actually reduce the amount of information that we need to send to the client. So the editor, all you need is the text. You need the location, the text caret, the cursor. What are the ranges of highlighted text, of folded text? What are the gutter icons, and so on? And that's actually a reasonable small uh, piece of uh, set of data. And from that, you can recreate that on the other end. Uh, Pop-ups like the Alt Enter menu, uh, again, it's just a list of text and icons, very lightweight, very sort of straightforward. Toolbars, a list of actions, text, and icons. Again, um, a small, um, simple way of, of working with that. And if we handle these pieces generically, we can scale it. So again, if you can support one toolbar, you can support all toolbars. If you can add one item into the Alt Enter menu, then it's just gonna work because it's just a block of text. So um, I mentioned that Ryder built this, um, this protocol, this, this, this inter-process communication, which uh, work, has worked very nicely for Ryder. It's an observable, stateful uh, communication. It's uh, the RD protocol, um, which just gets confusing now because we've got RD for remote development, and it's uh, RD for, for this, and RD is the logo for Ryder. So there's too much RD going on, but that's fine. Um, and so we use the same protocol in remote development and in uh, Code With Me to create a hierarchical, observable collection of models. And I mean sort of hierarchical there in that you know, you've got an editor, an editor has got text, the text has got uh, highlights, the highlights have got a range, um, the editor window has an alt enter menu, the alt enter menu has uh, menus and uh, items and so on. So you end up with a, a hierarchical list of, uh, of data. And it's observable as well. So the, the model sort of persists on both sides, and you can, uh, the state is there on both sides. If you want to uh, look for changes, you can subscribe to changes on the different collections there. So my alt enter menu, I can subscribe to changes of, of items. And whenever a new item is added, I just add it onto the menu. Same with toolbars and things. Uh, and it's sort of synced from both sides as well. So. I can subscribe on either side. I can subscribe on the front end or I can subscribe on the back end. So I can push data from either side. And so we've got this nice two-way communication. Uh, so yeah, so we, we can do sort of reactive programming uh, going on there basically. You know, subscribe to the changes and react to that. So update the UI when a value changes or react to a button click in the UI. So again, from both ways. Uh, and we use view models rather than domain data. So again, it's more a bit more semantic. So we don't care that it's a particular action or anything. It's just a button. It's a button which has got text and icons. We don't care what it is. So um, 
to make this work, we basically just create common view models for the known elements, toolbars, and so on, and uh, those can scale. You know, so we describe our toolbar as an observable collection of buttons. There's text, icon, tooltip, text, icon, tooltip, and so on and so on. Add one in, and it just uh, we, we can just display it. The server populates this model. The client subscribes, recreates the UI on the, the front end. Um, having a common UI toolkit here helps. The fact that we've got IntelliJ on the back end and IntelliJ on the front end means that we can have a very sort of um, similar user interface. So they're both swing based and therefore they've got sort of very similar concepts. So while we're not necessarily doing things with, um, with graphics or, or I, uh, UI specific, having the same UI on both ends uh, helps because it's got the same concepts. Um, so, yeah, that's basically that. So, the way to put everything together then is to use this protocol. We subscribe to these listeners we've got. So again, if the text carrot moves, we, we notify our listeners and our observers to, um, to, to the, the change has happened. That gets pushed onto the protocol, which gets automatically synced to the other side, which is subscribing to those changes. It can react to those and it can update the UI. So it's, it's a nice sort of, uh, a nice pattern here which works really well. We've got this, this protocol, which can pass the data from both sides, and we've got these uh, synchronizers, which listen to changes from the platform API, which, you know, the synchronous platform API, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and, um, uh, and it joins everything sort of end to end. And these sort of synchronizers which are listening to the changes there, they can actually be implemented to one side. We don't have to change the way that the text carrot gets moved in order to tell the network that something has changed. We've got these sort of su subscribers listening to things and there, so it's a nice sort of decoupled, um, or loosely coupled, I should say, uh, way of working. Um, and so, so yeah, so that, that's basically how we send the, the data across. We've got these reactive models um, for the user interfaces, and then a list of ordered change requests. This one's um, a, a bit more sort of interesting because, uh, you know, I've been describing toolbars and what have you and everything, but what about the editor? The editor's a bit more complex. You can't just have, um, you know, sort of a list of text and buttons for, for that. Uh, how does that work? Well, um, the easiest thing we can do, well, the, probably the worst thing we could do is to try and do that round trip into the network. So they, they would be every key press you'd have, we'd, we'd go off to the service, tell us what to do, and it comes back and everything. That would, that would be fairly awful, I think, really. And if we're using the IntelliJ platform as our user interface, well, we've already got an editor, and it's a pretty good one because we're using it already. So why not just actually use that editor and have a local editor running on the, uh, on the, the client? And so that's what we do. Obviously, we then need, just need to sync the initial text Give you a copy, you know, give the, the client a copy of the initial text, tell it where the carrot is, tell it where the selections are, where the highlights are, where the gutter icons, <clears throat> excuse me, and so on. And with that, all that state is enough for us to completely replicate the editor because we're just showing the same thing as we would do on the on the IDE itself. I mean, if you've used the IDE, you can split a window and you actually get the same view of the same file there. Uh, we've got two two editors um, which look exactly the same. And it's the, the same idea. We just sort of recreate the state with the different attributes. So this is really nice as well now because we've got local processing of your text. You just type locally, uh, but all of the um, all of the work, all the processing, all the language processing happens remotely. So you just sort of type as you go on, and we'll notify the, the server, and all of that information will then come back into the client. So the, the syntax highlighting, the uh, errors, the pop-ups, the completion, that all still comes from the remote host. And all of that requires a network call. But that's gonna be um, a bit interesting because if we're still typing, we are kind of be working asynchronously and we'll be doing it at a slightly different speed to the network and what about latency and how do we kind of join those all together? Um, well, that's not what the slide says anyway. But um, yeah, so the yeah, so the, the point is that we've got our local editor, and that's a, a good thing um, because we we get a, a local. Um, it, it, as I say here, it, you know, it feels like a local editor because it is a local editor. Um, so we've, we've got a better latency than if we ha were round tripping to the network uh, all the time. 
and, um, and so on. We don't have to wait for the server to, keep on, to, to reply, we can just keep on typing, and so we can um, work nicely with that. And because we're just working with text changes to the network, then we can drastically change the way that the editor itself works, and it'll still be absolutely fine. So things like um, IdeaVim, if you use Vim at all, um, which can be a very different editing experience, you know, you, you can do a whole lot of uh, fun things with it. Um, don't get me started. And um, that, that can change exactly how, it, you know, how the editor works to you locally, but as far as the network concerned, it, nothing's changed because it's just getting those, those changes. But there, there are, you know, there can be problems. The, the, there are um, issues here with the fact that the, pro, the, so the host is doing things asynchronously and it might want to do changes to the text while we're still typing. And so we might have conflicts going on here. So for example, when you sort of uh, typing a method name, you hit open brackets, the uh, IDE automatically closes those brackets for you. You know, they can uh, do things like that. Uh, or if you're doing a refactoring, the refactoring can happen while you're still typing, you know, so it has to go off and think about something and then tell you what the changes are. So the backend IDE might want to edit the document while you're editing it. And so you might then have uh, a conflict and you might have uh, a problem. And the way this is, um, this is worked, uh, this is handled, is that the client maintains an ordered queue of change requests of every sort of everything you type basically, sends this to the server, which decides whether it's going to apply it or reject it, and then the client sends the next or rebases the queue and tries again. So to run through that a little bit more, in a bit more detail, the user types a letter, and as far as the local uh, machine is concerned, it, you, your text is inserted, and so the local editor is updated. The client creates a new request, and it adds it to a queue, and then that queue is serially sent to the server. So this request goes off, goes to the server, the server receives the request, checks the version, and then decides whether it applies or rejects it. So we've got versions here now, all of a sudden. So what happens is that both sides of the, um, of the IDE, the client and the, the, the host, they have a version of the document, for example. And any changes can increment the version and um, those versions then know whether you're working with an out-of-date copy or with the current uh, copy and whether you need to sort of fix things up. And so when the server uh, receives the request, it checks the version. If it matches, then it knows that it's working with the current version. It can apply those changes, send the results, um, and uh, carry on. If the versions don't match, it rejects it. So there's um, send results there as well. Those results might just be, yep, thanks, I've got your text, we've updated the document, or it might be, you know, I've updated the document, and here's a closing bracket for uh, what you've got. When that message gets back to the client, the client receives this, um, this result. If it's successful, then it just applies those results and carries on, sends the next item. So if it's the results was, uh, here's the closing bracket, It'll add that and it will send the uh, next message along. If it, if it wasn't successful, if the server had rejected that particular change, then what the request engine has to do, what the client has to do is undo all of the pending requests that we've already got, apply the current results, and then apply those changes back again. So it's effectively rebasing. If, you, you know, if you're familiar with Git rebasing, it's the, the same idea. You get your current state, your new state, and rerun all of the operations that were, that were pending. And there, so if I had typed my opening um, brace there and I decided to type a parameter, then the result comes back from the server. It says, here's the close bra bracket. Um, I have to kind of say, oh, okay, well, I've started typing something. I'll, I'll take away the method name that, uh, sorry, the, the parameter text that I was typing, apply that close bracket, and then in the same location I was, I can put my text back in, and it resyncs and sorts everything out. And once I've sort of rebased these um, requests then, I then send my next message, and, uh, and we're good to go. Oh, no, sorry, I send the, the current message, the, the message that got rejected, I'll have rebased that one, and I send that, and we just carry on, and we just loop through that, and we fix, um, we fix everything up. 
So that's, um, that's, that's how we can work with remote development. We can sort of split things up, up there. But then you kind of get to the question, great, well, what if that other machine, not your remote server there, if it was someone else's desktop, if it was an interactive thing which somebody else was using, how do we make this now multi-user? Because it kind of feels like it's the same thing there, but instead of the remote server being an IDE sitting in the cloud somewhere, it's actually sitting on someone's desktop. So can we host multiple users concurrently? Well, we've just looked at conflict resolution. That's going to work. That's easy. Well, <laughs> easy. The, you can extend that to, to work with uh, multiple users. So instead of just having one stream of changes come in that the server has to process, you have multiple streams. You just serialize those so that the uh, server processes them in order. And if people are changing different documents, that's fine, no big deal. If they're changing the same document, then everybody's going to have to have the same, we're going to have to be, a, uh, the versions are going to have to match. So whoever's got the latest version which works, that change is going to get accepted. If you've got a different version because I've changed it and you've, you're trying to change it as well, that's going to get rejected with the update and then you can resubmit it after you've rebased the changes. So everything can still work, but the difference is that the results of these things have to get broadcast to all clients. It's not just a one-to-one -one sort of message. <clears throat> Um, so that sort of takes care of uh, editors, really. It's, it's, um, you, know, you just sort of extend that, uh, the conflict resolution loop. Um, but there's some state which is uh, per user as well. So we've kind of got these uh, view models and things that uh, are working, we're working with. And with a single ID, we've just got one of those and it's fine. But if you've got multiple users, then we're going to have to suddenly start tracking extra state. So your list of open editors if there's just one user, then there's just one list. But if there's multiple people working there, you're going to have to have multiple of those. Undo stack is a good one, which um, <laughs> isn't perhaps uh, obvious, but it is desperately necessary. If I undo something, I don't want to undo your changes, and I don't want your changes or my changes being undone by someone else. So you want to keep your undo stack um, per user as well. There'll be various settings, such as filters in uh, pop-ups and so on. The current pop-up for completion, what tool windows are being shown, and also some of the state in the tool windows. So the project view, um, we don't necessarily want to show the same project view to everybody, because if I'm trying to find a file, but you're also trying to select something there, then we don't want to be uh, synchronizing that state. The other interesting thing about per client um, uh, issues is um, we're going to have per client activities. So who do we send the reply to? So if we are uh, starting some code completion, this is an asynchronous process. You know, we kind of get the request in. We have to get off the UI thread so we don't um, you know, cause latency. This is you know, in an interactive scenario. We get off the UI thread, do some processing, um, get our list of completion items, and then get back onto the UI thread to show it. But if we're doing that for remotely with multiple users, you know, we kind of get a network request in for code completion, we go off onto the background thread, figure out what's going on, and we need to come back to the network to tell the user what to display. But we need to know who it is that we're replying to, who has that information. And uh, that has been solved by adding a client ID which um, follows the flow of execution. Uh, and this is, this is, again, where it needs to be sort of built into the platform. We can't just do this. Um, you know, sort of ad hoc. It has to be provided by platform itself and something, again, that we want it to be as generic as possible because we don't have to change every single API to add a client ID. That's, that's going to be very, very painful. Uh, and this has been stored effectively as a thread local value. But, of course, we've got, you know, we're bouncing it to UI threads, uh, sorry, to, to back-end threads to process stuff. So the platform automatically passes this around. So it's got, we've got various uh, threading and coroutine APIs. Um, coroutines, if you're not familiar with Kotlin, is a way of doing sort of async uh, programming, which is um, really rather nice. And um, the platform has this support automatically. So you, you basically just say, what's my current client ID? And here it is. And so that's uh, one of those features which is really, really nice, and you just don't notice it's there. OK. Um, 
just to sort of finish up then, there's a, a couple of problems. We've, we've sort of, you know, we've talked about how we can get the editor working. The editor's pretty complex. We've talked about things like tool windows, and, uh, toolbars, and buttons, menu items, and so on. But there's other complex user interfaces going on here. How do we work with, with that? And, you know, if we've got a tool window, um, you know, we, we can't, I mean, on here, for example, we've got the Git tool window there. Uh, we can't just uh, describe those as toolbars and, and simple things like that. There's, you know, how do we do something for that? Each tool window is different. Um, how does that uh, work? And the way we do this is, um, is to reuse this protocol. We've got this protocol which has got our hierarchical stateful models. We actually create a model of the view. So we actually describe what the view looks like. You know, so um, we can use this for, for tool windows and dialogues. So dialogue is really quite um, a standard sort of uh, style of uh, UI. You know, it's gonna be a panel with a row which has got a button, another row which has got a text field, a row which has got a, a block of text and so on. And so we can create a way of describing those views. Um, and we've got a, a DSL, a domain-specific language as part of the API for describing those views. And um, we can then actually describe what the UI looks like, serialize that, send that to the client, and the client can recreate it. And again, this is great when we've got uh, a common swing-based UI because it's the same sort of concept. Um, you know, so we can then have, um, we're using our protocol, which is uh, observable. We can have observable pro properties on that. So text fields, um, if the text field in the dialogue, when that gets changed, is an observable value. It, we can process it on the server. The, the protocol takes, takes care of all of that for us. Um, this, however, requires rewriting the UI. You know, we, we've got to reuse this DSL in order to do it, and we wanted to avoid rewriting things. Uh, and so what we've actually done um, further on, so this, that was kind of the way we worked with a lot of things for, um, for, for Code With Me, with Gateway, uh, which requires sort of more of the user interface to actually work like this. Uh, we've built transformers which will walk the swing hierarchy and transform the model and sync, which is just kind of bonkers. You actually look at what the UI is and automatically recognize, here's a panel, here's a text field, I'll get the important properties out of that, put it into my model, send it to my uh, client, and the client can recreate it. But then there's some UI which is just too complex to implement like that. Um, you know, some, some of the grid views, things which have got very custom layout. Um, Jupyter Editor Notebooks is a, a thing there where we've got the editor which has got interactive panels inside the editor, um, which are very sort of tricky to work with at the moment. And so we go back to Projector. We were talking about this before. This is um, uh, the, the, the technology which will integrate, replace the renderer inside uh, Swing and intercept those values, send it to the client, and the client can then sort of recreate those. So we can actually use Projector to project a subtree of the UI, which is kind of bonkers, basically. It's effectively doing like remote desktop um, for just a, a corner of the UI. So if we've got a complex tool window or something, we can actually do that. Um, this is not ideal. Um, it introduces more network traffic and latency um, but it gets things working and while we, we are migrating things, so Jupyter Editor Notebooks, for example, we're making that a bit more remote friendly. So to, um, to, to summarize, basically um, the team that built this are, are crazy. It's, um, it's some fantastic uh, technology. I think it's uh, really impressive what we can do. The fact that we can you know, use Projector to grab effectively remote desktop, a corner of the IDE, or you know, we've got the conflict-free resolution and so on. And um, yeah, the, the team learned a lot from Rider um, and, and how things worked and used the same protocol and the same um, model and a way of representing uh, UI and stuff. Um, interestingly, the editor loop is different in um, Code With Me and uh, Gateway, which is why Rider doesn't have Code With Me right now because the editor loop We've got two different ways of syncing conflicts and um, uh, resolving conflicts, and um, we're actually rewriting the way Rider works to be more like Gateway and, and Code With Me. Um, so yeah, if we can sync the UI building blocks, we can scale. So we just sort of create models which build the uh, the the the, uh, the small changes. We can sort of expand that up and we can scale that out. 
Editors all implemented locally. Um, we've got a set of change requests which we send across. Those are synced and resolved and rebased if necessary. Uh, and then the other thing then which is really uh, quite cool is the client ID sort of automatically um, resolves through, uh, flows through the platform API and through different threads. Um, what's next is uh, things like, you know, we want to cover all the platform UI, so we've got things which are uh, implemented by projector right now that we want to work, which are a bit more um, friendly to being run remotely. We want to make sure that everything sort of works there. We want to get Rider uh, working and supported. Um, going forward as well, we just, um, it, it's now sort of like a part of the, um, the way we work now is to ensure that all APIs are remote and collaborative by default. So while we haven't necessarily had to ch make changes for uh, a lot of things, then we can um, make sure that we support it uh, in the future. Uh, and yeah, so we want to support things as first class citizens. Uh, and then of course there's, there's various feature roadmaps as well. So getting code with me inside remote development. So um, that brings me to the end. Um, if you want uh, to actually play these th with these things, as I say, if you've already got a license, um, you can have a go with remote development with SSH to a virtual machine or code with me, just click the button and join a session is good. Um, that um, building rider link at the bottom there is uh, my colleague Martin's talk about, um, about more details of how rider itself works. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please give me a shout. Oh, and the stickers as well, if anyone wants a sticker. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. So the question is, did we do any analysis about um, the benefit of moving to a remote de development style? Um, in, in what kind of way for a start? Ah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so the, the, yeah, the, the, any analysis on the difference between um, remote desktop and remote development? Um, I don't think we've done any sort of formal analysis, uh, rather just that it, it is because we, we've seen the volume of traffic that, that goes through and we know that the protocol that we use is lighter um, because we're sending less data. You know, we're, we're sending small blocks of changes uh, for everything, we, you know. We don't have to send a, um, a, a flashing cursor, you know, a co constant network. I know it, it, they turn off the flashing cursor over there, but you know, we, don't, we don't need to be having uh, sort of constant data going uh, being sent there, we can just send much more lightweight information. So I don't think we did any formal analysis, no. Cool. Anybody else? Hello. Um, you mentioned uh, port forwarding. Yes. Which makes a lot of sense for web or API development. Um, well, do you have plans for uh, anything to do with native development um, or I guess more complex environments like Unity or anything like that? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. One of the things with remote development uh, as it stands is that it's a, it's a, a, a good tool for uh, web applications, you know, for anything that's web-based because you can easily forward ports and you can uh, work with it and, uh, and so on. However, any kind of desktop application, you then back into the realms of uh, re re remote desktop. And uh, yes, we do have plans. Um, nothing to announce at the moment. However, you know, you're gonna have, it, it's gonna have to involve some kind of remote desktop component, basically. Anybody else? Hello there. Um, you mentioned Vim extension running client side. Yes. Which makes sense. But, so like, have you got a target or like sort of baseline for how sort of thin the client should remain versus how much needs to be on the client to support that sort of extension? Or will that eventually move to the server? Obviously a rewrite of the extension, but. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's interesting because um, extensions are, um, are, are an interesting one because uh, most of the time the extensions need to use the APIs that we've got which understand what the language is all about, so our syntax trees, the indexes, and so on, all of those all live on the server. 
And, and so if you have an extension which requires that kind of thing, so I'm adding a new inspection for something, then that has to live on the server, and that's supported. You know, because again, the, the, the process is general purpose, and if you add a new inspection, it just flows through, because it's just, as far as the uh, protocol is concerned, it's a highlight in a particular location on the editor, there's no semantic meaning to it at all. So extensions which require knowledge of your project have to live on the server. The only things that can live on the client are, um, th they have to be quite dumb, basically. We don't provide, uh, at least in the moment, we don't provide a way for a client-based extension to talk to the, um, to the server. And uh, uh, you know, so if you had a, an extension on the server and an extension on the client, we don't provide a way for the two to talk together. Um, that's, there's, there's a lot of complexity in, involved in that. Um, so right now, client-side extensions, are, they, they have to be done. So it, it is basically down to, to customization. Themes, key maps, um, and then tooling like, I mean, IDFM is the, is the best example for this because it is, it's a complex um, uh, extension, but all it does is change the way the editor works. And in fact, there's a couple of um, features in that which do try to use language features, but they're not available, and so those things fail. And so we, we also need to figure out a way of making that work, but we don't know how that is at the moment. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's us for time. So once again, thank you very much. If you'd like a, a sticker, I've got a few at the front there. Thank you.